This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things KISS. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. So you love the show. Go to itunes.threesidesofthecoin.com and leave your review and rating of Three Sides of the Coin. Thanks. Back now with Mr. J. Hold on, you're supposed to say, we're back! Motherfuckers, just the way D does it. That's the way he did do it. Come on. To deal with this every week. That's fine. Boy. He's yeah, going fanboy on you right now. That's fine, man. Because you gotta, you know, when you do this kind of stuff, you have to be animated. Amen. You have to be intense. Right. You have to have the credibility of a televangelist, right, or a heavy metal guy. Because we both, basically, if you think about it, TV evangelists, heavy metal musicians, and professional wrestlers have about the same equal level of credibility. That's how I kind of look at it. And yeah. I'm, I'm right yeah. there with you. You're probably That's right. That. All right, you got that, you <laughs> punk, you pencil neck geek. Oh, what yeah. do you guys want to know? Do, do you like to be the baby face or the heel? Well, there's, you know, baby face is such a lame position I know, in wrestling. The heels are the best. And it I wasn't know. until, I mean, first of all, I was a huge Ultimate Warrior fan, you know, and he yep. was... He was great, and I, I look. Holy I shit! Look, I followed. See, folks, they're not talking about me. <laughs> <laughs> they're, not, they're not remotely impressed. They're not remotely impressed that I know wrestling history going back to Nature Boy Buddy Rogers and the very first WWF belt, yep. which I saw him win. Okay, nice. Nineteen in 1962, Crusher. motherfucker. We're talking. We're talking the original guys, the Kangaroos, the first tag team champions. When wrestling was real. When, oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, when it was real. Yeah. <laughs> Real. You know, my father said this to me when we were watching it for the very first time. I was ten years old, and he had it on, and it was just when, it was just when Buddy Rogers just won the first belt, and my father's saying, you know, this is this is wrestling, and I said, wow, it looks funny. He goes, it's totally fake, and I said, why do you watch it? He goes, because it's fun to watch, but it's fake. I said, does everybody know it's fake? He goes, some do and some don't, but nobody really cares. Nobody Everyone cares. just kind of enjoys it. So over the years, we I. I started watching it, and then then I got sucked up into it during the Cindy Lauper period. Yep. Oh, so yeah. we wound up. I wound up being part of a vignette in which I was at the Garden the day that that Lou Albano gave Cindy Lauper her platinum record, and so I was in the basement as they were creating the platinum record, which was basically on a piece of balsa wood that weighed a sixteenth of an ounce. You know, so so um, you know so Lou Albano saying yes, yeah, so I'm gonna get on the ring. You know, and then when they hand me the record, I'm gonna break it over his head and then he's gonna go into shock and then we're gonna bring the ambulance out and put him in a neck brace and then JJ I need you to be in the ambulance with him and hold his arm and like Dave it'll be okay it'll be okay, it'll be okay. <laughs> and I got sucked up into it so I'm there they bring out this thing that weighed about a sixteenth of an ounce they couldn't break a butterfly's wing <laughs> bash him on the oh, oh, oh. He's all over the floor. Oh, convulsions. Quick, quick convulsions. Yeah. 20 guys go there. You know, they put the neck brace on him. They put him in the ambulance. And they're taking him away. They're in the belly of Madison Square Garden. And they go, JJ, you know, a moat, a moat. And I go, Dave, 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 it'll be fine. You know, it'll be fine. You, you haven't lost your ability to walk. I promise on you. What the fuck? <laughs> what am I doing? Yeah. It was kind of fun. That's great. It was kind of fun. Well, we were just talking before you came over about what an incredible convention this is and talking about the Q&A you did last night with, with Mark and how interesting that was. That was probably one of the coolest things. I I've love the seen. business talk. Yeah. Oh. Um, I happen to try to make it, I try to make it entertaining because yeah. there's a lot of things to say and a lot of observations to make. But I'm kind of fortunate in that Twisted Sisters' credibility or our ability to last as long as we've had is something we could never have predicted back in 1984. Look, I talked to the guys at Animal House, the, 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 the cast. I said, you got to sit there and just go, my God, 40 years later, Did whoever would have think. Yeah. You know, whoever would have And they said, you know, you connect with fans around the world that you would never have had the opportunity to because you created something that for some reason resonated in time. And... Twisted Sister, I can say, when we were doing We're Not Gonna Take It, if you would have said to me um, back in 1984, you know, you're gonna be, the, the bulk of your business is gonna be music licensing, I'd go, what is music licensing? What I don't even it? know what that is. What What is it? And now, of course, we are the most licensed, if you don't know, our music is the most licensed music uh, uh, of any band uh, in the 80s. Like okay. Kiss, Def Leppard, Metallica, no one even comes close to how many times our songs are used in movies, TV shows, commercials. It, it, just this week, Ready Player One, like I said yesterday, in the feature scene, Ready Player One, we're in it. 
it. We're in the new Mitsubishi commercial where they play I Want to Rock using classical musicians. Uh, Young Sheldon, we had two songs in Young Sheldon. Mexico, Walmart uses We're Not Going to Take It. It's And then, of course, the teachers union, like I said yesterday, and, and this Q&A, the teachers that union around great. the country, they all use We're Not Going to Take It. So now every generation succeeding, uh, every succeeding generation gets an opportunity to hear this song, which is essentially, without too much hyperbola, almost like the we shall overcome of this generation if you think about the great you know because if you think about we shall overcome it's a great impassioned protest song that anybody can use to overcome yep. adversity and we're not going to take it frankly can be used by the left can be used by the right it can be used by anybody, anybody for anything who feels any, for anything it just becomes one of these natural songs and because twisted sister was the creator of it it gives us this legacy which I, nobody could have predicted and i'm amazed by it. what about the guy from the yankees or can you tell us uh about him. Um, Mark, Desch which one? Mark. Uh, oh, Mark Teixeira. Well, okay. Let's look at it this way. So, Mark Teixeira used "I Want to Rock," and 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 um, Mike Piazza used "We're uh, um, You Can't Stop Rock and Roll." So, both of these guys used our songs when they come up to the plate. Now, you right. know how baseball players are traditionally superstitious; like they never want to break. Right. Tradition right. if the, okay, so Mark Teixeira has been using I want to rock so when he joined the Yankees from what I had heard When he entered Yankee Stadium when Brian Cashman brought him to New York as He entered the stadium with his wife, you know because they wanted to do the whole dog and pony show They blast and I want to rock in an empty stadium for him So he'd feel comfortable which is amazing. So when he retired two years ago um, We honored him by signing a guitar and giving it to Mark Teixeira at home Plate at the last game of the year in 2016 and now I am NOT a Yankee fan I actually hate the New York Yankees I was born I mean I was bred to hate them I, I have a National League family and you know how kind of like you know how this works back in the day when when baseball was religion you're either National League or American right. League and my parents were Brooklyn Dodgers you know and they were Giants and then the Yankees were the hated Yankees and this is how New York City runs like one way you really to be both is kind of lame you can pick one no, well, you understand. So, but here I am. The Yankees treated us so good. I can't hate. Like they gave us a sweet. You know, like you imagine. I go to the. I go to home plate at Yankee Stadium. The most hated place I could possibly ever be in, and I hear this, lady, lady, please we have a Jerry James for Lemon. Malik Millen Miller. Lemon Lemon Jerry. Sounds like Mushroom from Cosby. To celebrate the career. Oh, boy. No, they didn't tell Mark to share this because they wanted to surprise him. Mark to share comes bolting out of the dugout like a five-year-old kid like you're giving Holy me a guitar like I'm sitting there going I revered just athletes in general and here's this here's Mark Teixeira acting like oh my god I'm getting a side guitar for Twizzles <laughs> and I'm at home plate I can't hand the, the Yankees were the nicest the whole organization was unreal and now Mike Piazza how's this one comes to the plate every game his entire history to can't stop rock and roll that's great except on the 40th anniversary of the Beatles at Shea Stadium, Shea Stadium decided to hire a Beatles cover band to play the entire Beatles set, which is only 29 minutes, before they came that year. Ironically, not because it was set up, I was at the game with my daughter. And my daughter has got used to hearing we're not going to take it and every movie and everything. And we get there and we watch the faux Beatles do their set, okay. And they somehow arranged with the baseball union that every player that came up to bat had to come up to bat to a Beatles song, which must have been a shock to half the Latin players who probably <laughs> go, like, well, how did this? Ooh, I need your love, babe. Like, why is this happening? Okay, so Mike Piazza comes up to the plate and he demanded to have Can't Stop Rock and Roll all four times at the plate. So even though everybody else wow. had to use a Beatles song, he was. He made them play our song. You know how That's that was amazing. Un These are the things you can't. I can't even begin to articulate the kind of fun you have as a person that creates this stuff I, to yeah. know that kind of stuff. Well, and, yeah. and that's one of the things that always interests me. So, like for you, for instance, when you guys are out on tour. What's it like when you're in front of a packed house and all these people are singing lyrics to the songs that you wrote? I mean, is that something that you always is inspiring to you every time? The the crowds on our last tour averaged sixty thousand, and we did two one hundred and ten thousand people shows, and it's. 
here's how it is. We know what we do to audiences, so it's not that surprising, although it's still extraordinarily gratifying to have them sing our songs to us while we're playing, or to have them sing in between our songs. But when they're singing them in between songs that other bands are playing, when other bands are on, that's not going over too well. So Iron Maiden, they were singing to the point where Iron Maiden just kind of gave up and went, why don't you close the shows? Like they came up with some lame excuse, like, oh, you know, we got on show tomorrow. We got to get all 15 trucks in. <laughs> and we got such a long haul to the next one. Why don't you close? Meanwhile, they just didn't want to put up with the fans yeah. singing, we're not going to take it in between their songs. Yeah. So it's an incredible, it's absolutely an incredible experience. But I will tell you this, this is absolutely true. If you do this for a living, and this is what you do for a living, and you've played thousands and thousands of shows, it's the same as a ball player. When a, when a baseball team loses a game, they play 162 games that year, they don't really take it that heavy that game, but you, a fan, you take it very heavy, right? Because they lose, you're bummed out, you can't read the paper the next day. But to the guy in the team, they shrug it off, they have another game. So as a member of a band that plays routinely in front of these kinds of people, and, we've done, and I've done 9,000 shows, I'm not saying you get blasé, but what I'm saying is when you get off stage, you don't sit there and analyze the show. You just, you've done another show, right? You get in the van, and this is how the, typically the van rides would go. Danny would know this. We're in the van, and, uh, and AJ and I pull out our phones, immediately start looking at the Met scores. Because all we care about is if the Mets win or lose that day. So like, and then all you hear is, like, if the Mets lost. Now, understand, there's 100,000 people. Just finished playing the twists. Like, ah! We get in the van. AJ, okay, we're in Europe somewhere. Fuck. The Mets lost. I go, <laughs> Danny goes, fuck, the Mets lost. That's all we're doing is discussing the Mets fucking losing. Did you take the guys in the Mets? The Mets yeah. Twisted Sister, did you? <laughs> yeah. I, I said, I said, AJ, why are we getting depressed about the Mets when they lose? You think they're sitting there going, JJ had a bad night. What a drag. <laughs> he missed the solo on Can't Stop Rock. Like, do you think they give a rat's ass about whether AJ dropped a drumstick in the middle of his song? But this is how it kind of, that's, so yes, it truly is. But I will tell you, we took the responsibility of the job. I hate to use that word, but what it is. No, it's the responsibility of what we do very, 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 very seriously. Which is why every time I've ever seen a Twisted Sister show, it's been awesome. And I'm going to give you a quick sideline from the outskirts. JJ, also being the manager of Twisted Sister, playing guitar in front of 60,000 people, runs over to me on the side of the stage. How many people do you think are here tonight? He goes, 60,000. He runs back out, he plays. He comes back out, he goes, how do you think we're doing a merge? I said, I, <laughs> I love it. I'm on the side of the stage, he runs back out. Did you collect our money tonight? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you, well, you, people used to say to me, how, do you, how does the night affect you? I said, the minute we hit the, the minute the intro tape starts, which is, it's a long way to the top, which has been our intro tape for years, it gives you shakes because you, know now, you now know that you can't go back. You can't stop. Like now for the next two hours, it's showtime, right? So you get the little buzz. And then as the manager, I get on stage. And all I'm looking at is to make sure the monitors are working right, the lights are okay. Um, just you're doing a checklist. It takes me two songs before I'm convinced that the night's going to go well from a production standpoint. Right. So while, and I don't know what the other guys are thinking necessarily, but as the manager, this is the checklist that I'm going through. So I'm kind of just watching, making sure everyone's cues are correct, the mic stands are in the right places. Because when you do throw and go festivals, let me explain this to people who don't understand throw and goes. Throw and goes is a term used when you go to see a festival with 20 bands and every band comes on with a 45 minute break. You don't know what those crews have gone through to be set up for that, for that next yeah. shot. Those crews are frantic. One crew is breaking down a whole set. The next crew is putting all the amps together, all the effects together, all the drums together, and they all have to hit the mark so that at that particular time, the intro tape stops. It's called a throw and go. Well, we, we specialize in throw and go, but that means that everybody in your crew, not just the band, but every Everybody in the crew has to be a specialist at what they do, and their focus is the minute that last band's off the stage, they got 45 minutes to turn that stage around, and that stage has to be turned around. So the pressure on them to make sure everything is right, the pressure on us, the pressure on Danny, because Danny's then coordinating between the stage and us in the back, and with our people in between. There's, you know, we have a very tight professional crew, and everyone takes their job dead seriously. And finally, when the night's over and the crowd's screaming, you know, the band can take a break, the crew has to break down and get ready for the, and they keep, they keep going. It's an amazingly tough gig. This is Three Sides of the Coin, talking all things 
Kiss. I want to rock and roll all night. You're listening to Three Sides of the Coin. 